Okay, good morning everyone, and uh, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna talk here about the, uh, the past, the present, and, and the future. Uh, I, I've been with GSEP right from the beginning in 2003, uh, and, and there's really a lot that I could tell, but only uh, about 20 minutes. So the past will be uh, very brief. Uh, I'll, I'll spend most of my time talking about results from just this year. Uh, where some exciting things have happened and, and, and then a glimpse of the uh, future. Uh, so the, the beginning for GSEP is, is, is very personal to me because uh, I was already here and uh, this was my research group. And uh, literally the day um, that I found out that I got one of the grants, I was having a group meeting uh, and telling some of these people that I thought they should probably look for a new advisor because uh, my startup funds were gone, my NSF career funds were gone, and uh, I, was, I was just basically gonna have to lay off students. I, I just couldn't uh, uh, pay them. And uh, five of these seven were, were working on solar cells. And after I gave that speech, I go back to my office and the congratulatory uh, email is there and uh, I had a $900,000 grant, uh, ran back, they were still in uh, the, the meeting room, and, um, and, and there was a great celebration. Uh, I put five of those people on the grant, I was not supposed to do that, didn't ask for permission, uh, overspent the grant by 90,000, uh, but that was okay because other people hadn't done their hiring yet. So uh, uh, my overspending was offset by um, other people's underspending. Uh, and uh, anyway, everything worked out. And uh, so we, we, we got off to a start. We were working on organic solar cells. And um, uh, in the end, I think we've written a couple hundred papers on that subject. Um, we, we were later on able to get $25 million uh, from Saudi Arabia to expand that out with uh, about 15 other uh, uh, research groups. And uh, we learned a lot along the way. And, and you know, later on, um, this is the research group. And uh, so in addition to, to saving us there in the beginning and allowing us to start, uh, uh, GSEP along with funds from other sources uh, allowed us to have a large activity. Um, and, and in this photograph, every single one of them work on uh, uh, solar cells. Uh, uh, after those original two who were not doing solar cells, everyone in my group uh, did, did solar for, for well over a decade. And that meant that we could do everything. We could make the materials, we could, we could, we could look at every layer in the solar cell, we could characterize it, uh, the structure, we could look at the electrical, the optical properties, we could build models. And, and then uh, talking to people in industry at these meetings um, allowed us to, to learn about cost modeling. Uh, we were getting constant feedback on uh, you know, some of our early designs. We thought they'd be cheap and, 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 and industry was just laughing at that and they're like, no, you know, you're, you're gonna raise the costs by a factor of 10 um, using some of your really sophisticated you know, nanotechnology designs. Um, and, and so we got a lot of, lot of feedback and, and um, even started getting into uh, uh, studying degradation and making cells durable, which is, is not something you often see in academia. And uh, really allowed us to, to, to strengthen that whole thing and each generation of students passed on a lot of knowledge uh, to, to the next. Uh, while all that was happening, uh, the target that we needed to reach um, just uh, got better and better and, and better. And um, you know, here's, here's the story of the, uh, the prices of silicon cells uh, dropping and, and then in um, the last 10 years, the deployment really rising uh, dramatically. And most of you probably know that story. I wish I could say I had a part of that. Uh, I didn't. Uh, maybe some of my students, uh, you know, went to work for a few American companies and helped a little bit, but, but mostly this is the story of, of, of Chinese uh, silicon. And, uh, you know, now um, you could, you, the, the prices have dived again this year uh, due to another oversupply situation. The, the Chinese are expanding their factories again. 
and now the price is, is, is at 42 cents per watt uh, for silicon, which is really uh, remarkable. And uh, yeah, in places like California, if, 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 you're not, if you don't have solar on your roof, you're, you're just throwing money away, uh, uh, picking a more expensive option uh, for, for getting your power. Uh, some people, uh, it's interesting, some people still tell me I'm wasting my time, solar is never going to make it. Others are telling me I'm wasting my time because the problem's already solved. Uh, fortunately, some, some people think that uh, we are at a, at, at a good place. Um, I, I think continued research is still needed. Uh, I, I think we need more efficient panels. Uh, the value of an extra efficiency point is three cent per watt, meaning that um, you, you would rather pay 70 cent per watt to get 25% efficient panels than to buy the 16% the efficient uh, panels at around 42 cent per watt. Because more efficient panels, you know, they're giving you more power, so you don't need to install as many of them. And, and right now, we're paying more to install the panels than, than people are paying for the panels um, themselves. So efficiency is really important. And especially in a residential situation where your roof is not large enough uh, to get the power that you'd like with today's cells. And in that case, is there, there are situations where, where people, it would make sense to pay even up, up over $1.50 per watt to get 25% efficient panels if they were available, which, which today they're not. You can't buy that. And, and then the other thing, and Antonio Buonasisi at MIT makes this point really well, it's really not clear that the solar industry is going to grow um, as needed uh, to, to, to meet the, uh, the climate targets. And, and I'll just boil this down and make it really simple. Um, the companies are not making enough profit to fund the next generation of, of factories. In fact, most of them right now are not making profit at all. Uh, now, the Chinese are building them anyway, and I'm not sure I understand that. Uh, that, that gets away from my material science um, uh, expertise. But it's not clear that, um, you know, that we're going to see a, like a 10x expansion of factories um, due to a combination of low profits and the, the factories to make a silicon solar cell are rather expensive. So if we could reduce the capital expenditure needed for a factory, that uh, would, would be extremely helpful. Uh, here you see the efficiency of, of uh, five uh, kinds of materials advancing with time. And I think the, the black line near the top is one of the more important ones. That's silicon, and, and, and silicon is about 92% of the market right now. And, and you know, mostly that, that has been flat around 25% for uh, um, you know, about 20 years, although a, a world record of 26.3 was obtained uh, about a month ago. Um, above that is gallium arsenide, and, and you can get 28% with that, but it's, it's about 40 times more expensive, and I have a hard time seeing how uh, gallium arsenide becomes the primary photovoltaic material. The, the blue and purple, that's the thin films, cadmium telluride and, and copper indium gallium selenide, and they're both at 22. And First Solar is doing uh, very well. They're the most profitable solar cell company, and uh, they use thin films of cadmium telluride. But the story I, I want to tell the rest of the day is the perovskites, which just came out of nowhere. And um, uh, we went from a few percent, and now they've caught SIGs and CADTEL. They're also at, at 22 percent. And once again, GSEP helped me enormously. I, I did not invent the perovskite materials, but um, uh, this, as soon as I saw it, I knew it was the material that I'd been looking for uh, for over a decade. And, and we wanted to get on it right away, and, and GSEP came through. Uh, with a large grant for uh, Hema Karunadasa and I to get started on this uh, right away. Uh, this, is, this is the crystal structure of the material. The, the original one that, that generated the excitement was methyl ammonium uh, lead iodide. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll show you later, there's other things that we can put into that crystal structure to uh, uh, tune the properties. Uh, what's really exciting here is that you can dissolve this material and then just print it. So picture like a newspaper printing press putting out solar cells. 
Um, and and I, I wish I could tell you that, you know, we'll just spray paint the stuff on the roof and it'll practically be free, um, but that's not true. Um, you, there, there are a number of layers in the cell. It needs electrodes. It needs to be properly packaged. I don't have a cost model that I'm able to show publicly, but the cost structure would be very similar to a thin film cadmium telluride cell. And this is published uh, data from Mike Woodhouse at, uh, at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And uh, we don't, we're not really going to change the three things on the right. We're, we would have similar electrodes. We would have glass packaging. We would have similar encapsulation and junction box. What we can change is the uh, buffer and absorber, which is another word for the semiconductors. And I think maybe we could cut that in half. Um, which, uh, which means that, and, and you know, right now cadmium telluride is at 40 cent per watt. So uh, we could maybe go down to 35 cent per watt. Uh, but if you look at the top, you'll see this is for a 16 percent module. Um, and, and I believe we can do uh, better than that. And, and I believe cadmium telluride will do better than that. And, um, and so you, 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 with higher efficiency, uh, while holding the cost per area constant, you see a pathway to costs uh, going down in, into like 25 to 30 cents uh, per watt. Uh, here's an example of how we can tune the properties of the material. Uh, on the top, uh, we're gradually replacing the iodine with bromine, and um, you, the, those are solar cells. You can see metal electrodes on the top, and you can see the color of the perovskite uh, changing. Um, on the left, the band gap is low and, and the entire visible spectrum is being absorbed and, and the material looks black. And as we go over um, uh, to the right, some of the red and orange photons are not uh, being absorbed. Um, in the lower line, the methyl ammonium is replaced by formimidinium and um, it has a slightly different size. And um, later I'll show how um, uh, replacing the methyl ammonium greatly improves the stability of these uh, materials. Uh, the reason I bring up tuning the band gap of the semiconductor is I believe the future of solar is going to be tandems. Uh, uh, on the left, you see a structure, a, a schematic, uh, that can give a 46% a efficiency. That's the world record um, right now. Uh, but these are single crystal 3.5 semiconductors, and I don't personally think those costs are going to come down nearly enough. They're, they're over $40,000 per meter squared compared to $90 per meter square for cadmium telluride. So I think we have to, to, to uh, go away from the single crystals, and, and I'm excited to put things like perovskites on silicon. Um, silicon has a good band gap for the uh, bottom cell in a tandem, and perovskites uh, can be the higher band gap. And the idea is, is just that a higher gap cell is going to harvest the higher energy photons and deliver a high voltage, and then a lower band gap cell is going to harvest the infrared photons um, and, and still give us uh, some power. Just with two semiconductors, you can do better uh, than, than with one. And the theoretical limit for a two-terminal or a two, two semiconductor tandem is 43%, and I, I don't think in a cost-effective manner, we can do that, but I absolutely think we can get 33% efficiency um, at something like $105 uh, per meter squared, and, and that would be an extremely powerful uh, technology. Uh, there are a couple ways you can imagine uh, making this, and uh, on the left, you see uh, what we call a mechanically stacked uh, four-terminal tandem. Uh, here, uh, the two solar cells have their own electrodes. Um, on the right, it's a, a monolithic two-terminal tandem. Uh, when we go with the two-terminal tandem, we have to uh, design it such that the two semiconductors uh, uh, produce the same current density. If one of them has a lower current density than the other, it, it limits the current of the whole uh, stack. And that can certainly uh, uh, be done. Um, although, um, when, the, when, when clouds come along, it changes the spectrum, and, and, it, and it's hard, uh, or not just hard, I, it, it's impossible to always have that current matched. So uh, on the left gives us a little more flexibility. 
And uh, what we really like about the architecture on the left, we don't have to change the silicon at all. We just take it however any company wants to make it and we put our stuff um, on, on top. And by the way, uh, you could use SIGs as well. Copper, indium, gallium, selenide also has uh, uh, an ideal uh, uh, band gap. Um, we, we made the first of both of these prototypes, but right now EPFL has the world record for the left architecture at about 25.2, and I'll show you soon our world record of 23.6 uh, for the structure on the uh, right. Um, a lot of people uh, initially criticized this idea of, of a mechanically stacked tandem. They said you don't want to have four wires coming out. You don't want to have two separate inverters. I completely agree, and that's why we would do something like you see here. We would just adjust the areas of the cells as needed um, and then put the bottom string um, in series uh, with the top string. There's actually a lot of things you can do, various ways of current matching or voltage matching, um, but it's only necessary to have two wires coming out. And if the uh, current match changes as the spectrum changes, you could imagine a little circuit in there um, that uh, would, would make adjustments and, and fix that for you so that you would always extract uh, the, the maximal amount of power. I really have to fly through how we got that world record. Um, we, and, you know, we and, and I have to acknowledge there are a thousand, literally a thousand or more researchers out there in the world um, who, are, who are hard at work in the labs as I speak, um, developing all these new compounds, and, and here we catalog some of them, and uh, we, we don't yet have our ideal band gap of 1.80V, but we do have the cesium, formidinium, lead, bromide, iodide compound that uh, works really well, has a, has a band gap of 1.6, it's very stable, and uh, we, we were able to put it on top of a heterojunction silicon cell from Zach Holman at ASU. And, and I guess the point I'll just make here in, in the spirit of this session is that this is the culmination of, uh, of what we've been doing for 17 years. Um, there's a lot of layers in this stack and, and uh, you know, we know how to deposit them all. We know how to select them. We know how to get the energy levels right. And um, we have programs that allow us to calculate how thick all these layers should be. And uh, we got this working remarkably quickly, did not have to um, make hundreds of, of tandems uh, to, to get this um, NREL certified uh, 23.6 uh, world record. Um, and I will say we're, we're uh, in the last uh, couple months, we've developed five improvements. Um, we usually isolate the improvement. We don't, uh, on a daily basis, make the entire stack. And when we do the, the next generation, it's going to be about 26 or 27 uh, uh, percent uh, efficient. So really excited about that. Um, and, and at that point, we truly will have upgraded um, the world record uh, silicon solar cell. I, I should also point out, this is a key number, um, that's a 21% efficient uh, silicon cell on the bottom. Um, so we've upgraded uh, a 21% cell up to 23.6 um, using a perovskite that was only 15.5. Um, and now we have better perovskites uh, that, that'll allow us to get 26 or 27. Uh, yeah, so two weeks ago, a science paper uh, uh, came out. Um, uh, Giles Epperon uh, is a graduate student, uh, or was a graduate student at, at, at Oxford with Henry Snaith, and um, he figured out how to get a lower band gap with tin. And um, uh, Henry's a good friend, and um, uh, they knew we were good at making tandems, so they um, uh, sent the material over here for us to make a tandem, and, and we further optimized the material. Here you just see how the, we, we can adjust the band gap uh, by um, uh, adjusting the tin to lead uh, uh, ratio. And uh, this is an SEM of, um, of an all perovskite uh, uh, tandem, and uh, this first one was at 17%. Uh, and uh, we, we will be able to do way better uh, when we just figure out how to make this new material uh, thicker. Uh, it, it, it has very low voltage loss, and we just haven't made it thick enough to absorb all of the light. Uh, so I, I'm very optimistic that, that that could go up to 25% fairly soon. 
Uh, we've got 20% when we do the four terminal tandem uh, where, where the 1.2 and the 1.80V materials are, uh, or 1.6 have separate uh, uh, contacts. And um, so in a way, I like this business opportunity of upgrading silicon. I think it has an easy path to adoption, but I now also see how uh, we could do it all with perovskites and, and we could print this on plastic and, and uh, we could have uh, flexible cells uh, in the reasonably near term at 25% and, and I think 30% is ultimately uh, doable. Degradation is, is one of the main concerns here and um, I, I have to say I was, I was trying to be very cautiously optimistic about a year ago um, back then, our cells were only lasting a few minutes. We have improved this uh, by well over four orders of magnitude in the last year. The, the key is you got to replace metal electrodes with something like indium tin oxide because the halogens and the perovskites react with most metals. You've got to get the methyl ammonium out of there, and then you have to package it. Um, so here, here's a picture of a cell that's been on a hot plate at 100 degrees. The, the, the reddish square, that's where we have ITO. Yellow is where we don't have ITO. When methyl ammonium leaves, you're left with lead iodide and, and the lead iodide is yellow. So you see that the ITO holds in the methyl ammonium and, and, and you get a 10,000 X improvement right there. But you, you want to have multiple layers of defense, and um, it's also best to just replace the methyl ammonium with cesium and formimidinium. Uh, why do we use both? Cesium is too small to fit in the lattice, formidinium is too large, and um, on, if you mix them, then on average they're the right size and it gives you a more robust uh, crystal structure. And that, um, that also, that just gives us the, the, the temperature stability that uh, we need. And then with the combination of those two, and, and of course that, by the way, makes it a lot easier for us to put the indium tin oxide uh, down on top. And then those combinations allow us to properly package the cell. Um, uh, DuPont was extremely helpful to us, and, and I guess it's in their best interest to teach us how to use their materials uh, to, to package cells, and, and, and they did that. And, uh, uh, we didn't even try to invent anything here. We just use industry standard uh, uh, materials. And, um, and then uh, we went out to pass the industry standard tests, the so-called IEC tests. Uh, one of them is 1,000 hours at 85 degrees C, 85% humidity. And uh, two of our three packages uh, we passed on the first uh, run. In fact, if you look closely at the data, the efficiency actually went up. Um, uh, previously, we, we couldn't anneal our cells because they, they were so thermally unstable and, and now with, we're able to anneal them and, and even improve the uh, efficiencies. Uh, so we're really excited about uh, that. Um, we, um, we've passed uh, a temperature cycling test 200 times between 85 degrees C and minus 40 where the cells are constantly expanding and contracting and uh, they did not uh, uh, delaminate. Uh, we've passed a test under uh, intense ultraviolet light um, and we're now doing a lot of uh, testing under, um, uh, under one sun or, or in sometimes more than one sun uh, conditions. So Outlook is looking just vastly better than it did uh, a year ago. Uh, and so, yeah, on efficiency, um, uh, I, the single junction right now is at 22% and a pretty good slope versus time. And, and I think uh, there's a good chance single junction cells will be at 25. Um, we now have uh, the band gaps we want for both single junction perovskites and uh, uh, tandems. The tandems, um, are, the four terminal is already over 25%. Um, and and uh, I think 30% in, in the near term um, is, is, is certainly doable. Uh, there are now at least five companies commercializing uh, 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 perovskites, um, and uh, uh, one of them is, is uh, founded uh, by uh, Colin Bailey and I. That's Colin there. He, um, he, I might not be here today. He texted me to say that he's sick, uh, but um, perhaps he'll, he'll um, be able to come by in the, in the afternoon. Uh, so we're going to try to do the mechanically stacked tandems and uh, Oxford PV 
uh, uh, is, is going to try to do the monolithic uh, two terminal tandems. I think it's great that Henry founded his company and I founded mine, but we're still able to work together and, and uh, pop out that science paper uh, this month. Um, but also in terms of, uh, of GCEP impact, um, Richard never likes to take credit for these. Uh, he only likes to take credit for one of these 11 companies uh, that, that have all come from, uh, these were all founded by students um, out of my research group. And, and you know, you can read off the, the, um, the technologies and, and a lot of times the students um, did not spin out a company based exactly on their PhD uh, research, uh, but they learned from this ecosystem and while I was tackling some really hard long-term problems, um, and, and I, I never felt that the time was right to found an organic solar cell company, so they went a lot of times with, uh, with shorter term um, ideas, and, and, and um, uh, most of these companies have done very well. Some of them have already been uh, bought, for, like for example, um, DFly was bought by uh, uh, SunPower. Um, and and uh, so I, yeah, GSEP really created this environment, and I literally, I, 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 was, yeah, I told you at the beginning, I was at a point where I was going to have to give up on solar, um, uh, and, and I, I may have even left academia altogether and, and gone and gotten a job at a company, so I'm not sure any of that would have happened uh, with, without GSEP. And yeah, so finally, there's almost too many people uh, to, uh, uh, to thank. Um, uh, uh, Kevin, Kevin Bush made this world record 23.6% uh, cell, and Thomas Lightens uh, uh, took the lead on the perovskite perovskite tandem. Uh, but uh, really, a lot of, lot of, lot of people um, uh, from Stanford and other places as well who have contributed. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, we're really ready for lunch, but maybe if someone has one pressing question, uh, we can have one question and then we'll, we'll go on to lunch. Uh, Lawrence. I don't have a question, but in a way in demand. I listened uh, with fascination with Michael and, and Thomas' presentation. And thinking of what I said before, it would be so important that CGP can communicate this state of the innovations. And the problems you are facing, well, as we discussed yesterday, on the funding of new companies, I think the communication of where do we stand in innovation is absolutely central, again, to have this positive loop. So I don't know what you can do, like a sort of a report on results or telling the stories, I don't know. But of course, you have to go from, of course, this very sort of substantive presentation to something like government and others just make have a sense of where this is pointing to thank you we appreciate your, your comments mm -hmm. okay well i think uh mike i think we have to go to lunch so you'll be around at lunch I time and around. i'm sure I you can ask mike lots of questions so let's thank mike one more time and um, thank you mike <laughs>